Thank you. I think after lunch you'll be pleased I'm not going to give you a talk on biomarkers in cancer imaging. And uh, I can't really develop too much on, on the talk I gave last year because I think the time slot is about the same. So uh, what I'll do, try and do is uh, do some of the bits that were, I think people found interesting about Richard III but, and also emphasise forensic imaging um, as part of the sort of theme of the next hour. Um, so the key things uh, I suppose will, I hope will come out of this is to uh, give people a bit of enthusiasm about the concept of scanning dead people and to actually move our thought process a bit away from that and actually think a bit more about the fact that most of these scans, most of these people are actually our patients and they're still our patients. We still have a duty of care to them until the body's released back to the family. And so often in a hospital, the moment somebody dies, the medical profession lose interest uh, in them. And I'd like to say that actually from the family's point of view, there is still some work to do. And radiology uh, uh, gives us a way of doing it better. But we'll start with Richard III, uh, which is something we got into. And in fact, what I tend to do is focus a bit more on the non-radiology sides of it rather than the scanning, which is uh, somewhat more interesting. So most of us know the story from Shakespeare of this uh, supposedly wicked King of England for a couple of years, beat, beaten by Henry VII at the Battle of Bosworth. And things could have been quite a lot different if it had gone differently. He's known for potentially, possibly murdering the uh, children, the twins in the uh, Tower, Tower of London. And um, he was found in a car park in Leicester. And I'd like to show you how that happened. And the interesting thing about this is that this was all driven by amateurs. And so although the University of Leicester, Leicester expert archaeologists, osteoarchaeologists, uh, anthropologists uh, were involved in the investigation, the whole thing was driven by amateurs. And it just goes to show that there are quite a lot of areas where the truth is still out there. There are things to be found simply by looking at the records and deciding, do you know what, I think that's wrong. And it's a bit of a theme in James's talk of things that he didn't like from the literature, things that actually you look back on and accepted truths, if you look carefully, are actually wrong. And the accepted truth of Richard III, at the, uh, sort of 20 years ago, was that his body had been tossed into the river. He died in the Battle of Bosworth. Uh, he led a cavalry charge. You probably remember the a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. And in the Shakespearean uh, sort of play, it's a roughly right. He could have easily won that battle. There were, he had 8,000 men compared to 5,000. 5, and actually probably expected to win it, uh, but was betrayed uh, by a group of riders um, who didn't, uh, didn't support him uh, in, the, in the event. And if they'd have supported, they'd have gone one way or gone the other way, the battle would have probably gone differently. Interestingly, when you look at the story, it turns out that somebody, somebody's wife's brother's uncle, a bit like the, how these sort of royal things worked back in those days. He was uh, stripped naked, tied on a horse, and rode, ridden back to Leicester. The battle was about 20 miles out of town. And uh, given to the Greyfriars uh, sort of in a, a religious order, a monastery, and they were going to bury him. And the chances are, somebody of that importance, if they did bury him, they'd bury him in the choir of their church. Trouble was, is about 48 years later, Henry VIII uh, dissolved the monasteries. Uh, did he do it for principles or did he do it just because he wanted the money? Um, possibly because he wanted the money. Uh, but the tomb would not have survived that. They destroyed all these monasteries and certainly at that time that particular monastery was destroyed. And the legend was at that point, they, a crowd of people jeeringly picked up the body out of the tomb and dragged him through the city and threw him into the river. But people say, well, why, why would they do that? 70 years on, we don't tend to hold a grudge that long now. 70 years, somebody who died 70 years ago in a tomb, we're unlikely to uh, pull the body out and do that. 
Um, and in fact, there's a there's a uh, plaque in Leicester that's been there for quite a long time, saying this is where he was tossed into the river. Uh, that big plaque, and then there's a small green thing at the side by the Richard III Society saying, "I don't think so." <laughs> and that that predates uh, the uh, the dig. This is an old map of the uh, of the site where the Grey Friars would have been. And uh, interestingly, this is after the monastery's gone, but it was called Grey Friars uh, there. And interestingly, there's a house there, the Herrick's house, and the <laughs> dad of Christopher Wren, the famous architect, actually wrote in his memoirs that he'd wandered around the gardens of that house and there was a stone placard at the end of the garden saying, here lies once King of England, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so there was a suggestion that there was a, a recognition in this garden that Richard III was buried there, even though the, the, the chapel had long since gone. And that's what it looks like now, that map. Uh, the Martins Cathedral is there, and this is the area and the house was probably about here, and the end of the garden was probably about there. And uh, again, from that map, you can see there's that St. Martin's Cathedral, and the end of the garden kind of here. And actually, in a plot of land, people would have been able to guess that the monastery was probably facing east-west and would have been at the northern side of the, gar of the, the total uh, sort of area of the monastery. Uh, so for a variety of reasons, people felt, well, that's going to be roughly where it is, uh, based on quite a lot of other histories that said that gave no evidence of being thrown into a river. And if you put him over the map now, you can see that roughly where the choir of this church would be, if it's where we think it is, would be in a car park which is quite a coincidence, really, because even if you can work out where somebody is, the chance of actually in a city that you haven't dug it up uh, in three or four hundred years is very remote. So is it a car park rather than a foundation of a building, and has it been a car park all that time? This is the said car park. And I kid you not, that car was there before the start of the excavation. And a lot of people say, oh, it's obviously a reserved sign. Um, it's odd because actually all the reserve placards are at the top there. And it's not in the right place for a reserve sign. That would normally be in the space itself. I actually think the, there was a, a, an academic who actually wrote a monologue going through all this history about 20 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, and I think uh, either him or one of the Ricardians painted that R there um, because that's what they thought he was. So I don't think it's as a, I think it's less of a coincidence than uh, the story says. But they decided they were going to drink some foundations, and to be honest, nobody believed they were going to find the body. The justification, well, the Ricard, no, the Ricardians all believe they were going to find the body. They were absolutely convinced, but they're not scientists, they don't treat things properly, they're not cynical enough and all that. But the University of Leicester thought, do you know what, it's worth it, because actually digging up an old monastery may inform us quite a lot of things uh, about, you know, the history and so on. It's worth it in its own right. And the car park, as it happens, was sort of free. The school... Uh, this was social services. Um, oops. This was social services on one side, and this had been sold as a school. And essentially, it was mainly all it was all council stuff, so you could afford to do it. So they dug, picking on the R, and they started digging. And in six hours, thirty-three minutes, and thirteen seconds later, they found a skeleton, right where, exactly where people felt he was going to be. And interestingly enough, the skeleton had a bend in the spine. So now we have a death investigation. 
and I think that's the best way that in a way the professionals should treat it. And the tenets of that investigation do start with who. And they start with who, where, when, and how. And most of the work that we do is about how. Uh, but a lot of it starts with who. And that can be on behalf of Her Majesty's Coroner, the police, the Crown Prosecution Service. There are a variety of ways the investigation can get triggered. But it starts with who. And it's quite an important thing. In fact, identification is considered a basic human right. And although the identification CT in, uh, may not be an important part of investigation, identification and a lot of issues, uh, one of my colleagues is actually out in a meeting at the moment presenting the identification process in the dreadful tragedy at Grenfell Tower, um, where every single case there went through CT scanning. And the reason for that is it's not the, necessarily the most important part of the identification tool. There are a lot of ways you identify people, but it helps the investigation along in terms of speed. And again, it comes down to the fact that although when we worry about these issues and uh, we worry about the living, we worry about death, we often forget that the process of identifying the bodies and returning to the families is one of the most important things we do in that investigation. And it's often not talked about very much. And imaging actually speeds that process up. And as a result, imaging has been used in just about every circumstance recently around the world where imaging is possible for it. And the sort of investigation tools that we can use um, are listed. We all know about DNA. Uh, but a lot of times uh, it comes down to things like dental is very useful, medical implants are very useful, and of course if you've got partial remains, a CT scan uh, it's very useful when you've got a bag of remains to say there's dental in here, there's a hip replacement in here, there's, there's things you can identify. And so the people who have the unfortunate job of doing the identification can go straight to where the important information is. If you haven't got identifiers, then it comes down much more to anthropology. So you start having to start really basic. How tall were they? How big were they? Were they male or female? And that's often made on bone records. And of course, in this situation, we have the bones. It's pretty straightforward. But in a body, to get the bones out of a body requires, as you can imagine, a lot of invasiveness. And really, CT has made the process of stripping bones away in a body to do anthropological identification unnecessary, which is a huge boon because once you identify the body, you don't want to have to say to the family you return to, I'm afraid we had to go through a full anthropological investigation when men stripping all the bones out. There was DNA evidence, and uh, it's quite interesting really because. Um, They'd already identified a potential way of DNA identifying a, um, a relative of Richard III because they'd uh, previously dug up the remains of what they thought might have been a sister of Richard III and they'd traced a family. Now, tracing down the male line or standard DNA analysis is fairly uh, unhelpful because we know that even in about three generations, certainly in some parts of Leicester, you will, not, you will lose the link because the father who thinks he's the father of the child is not the father of the child. And it's certainly true, there is no match uh, on the Y chromosome line um, with, that we can identify uh, Richard III from. But on the female line, it's mitochondrial DNA goes exclusively down the female line. And we had a direct female line to uh, not Richard III, but to Richard III's mum, and uh, which was helpful for his sister's point of view. And interestingly, that probably would be gone in about 40 years because there's no female, there will be no female descendant down that line anymore that we can identify. It's all male then after that. And that's where the DNA link came in. In fact, from a chap called Michael Ibsen. Um, interestingly enough, it turned out that the DNA match uh, through the maternal line uh, was also a cabinet maker. So he was given the honor of making the coffin as well. 
So we found the boat, we scanned it. Uh, I can't take a huge amount of credit for the, uh, I didn't invent the CT scanner and I didn't even press the button to uh, do the scan. I was there. Um, we put the bones on there and one thing we would notice is that the bones are pretty low density. So when we put them all on the table, it was difficult to do 3D uh, reconstructions because the bones weren't much denser than the table itself, which is not a problem we have in normal clinical <laughs> scanning. Uh, so we raised them all off on a bit of polystyrene the second time we did the spine. And one thing we've started doing is this CT identification. And in fact, on a CT scan, we can pull out on one single CT scan just about everything that's required for an ID. And so we used a, a sort of anthropological ID process that we developed for CT scans, or one of the, our anthropology PhDs uh, developed it. And in fact, that would be our CT anthropological guess as to what these bones were, um, which is about right. He was about, th he was 32. And he probably uh, would have stood about 5'8 if he hadn't been bent. Now the usefulness of CT is obviously not particularly helpful when you've actually got the bones. But the beauty of CT is that we now still have the bones. Because the bones have been buried in the cathedral. But we've scanned him and we've printed it. And 3D printing is very useful, and most of us have come across it now for maxillofacial reconstructive surgery and so on, where we send our CT scans off, they get printed, and the surgeon can have a look and decide what they're going to do. And we can even start printing uh, prostheses and, and, and things like that now. So we've still got the bones to have a look at. And that's what they use to make the models of his, uh, of his face. I'm not sure I believe it, but uh, there it is. And we actually reconstructed his spine. I was quite interested in his spine because I was wondering how it would all fit together. He almost certainly has an idiopathic scoliosis. And if you had somebody with an idiopathic scoliosis who was 16 or 17, they would have a normal spine. But by the time he's got to 32, he's got all his facet joint disease and degenerative remodeling and so on. So when you actually you start plugging the bits of spine together, this one I did with, uh, in my shed with a drill, some wire and blue tack for the discs and some sort of felt disc spacers and, and so on. But it, it actually, you couldn't build his spine any different shape than that, which would make a sort of mid-thoracic sort of twist and a, a rotation, as would be classical for an idiopathic 70 degree uh, scoliosis, which is kind of what we guessed just looking at him in, in, in the grave. Uh, that's a sort of uh, 3D sort of photograph of, uh, of our model of his spine. We're doing a better version of it now with uh, proper discs and not blue tag. And one question we were asked at the time uh, is, could he fight with this scoliosis? Because some of the rumours was he was actually fighting a battle here. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, I was quite interested to see that uh, Usain Bolt has a, uh, about a 20 or 30 degree scoliosis. Uh, and he's the fastest, well he was the fastest man on the world. So mild scoliosis is very common and some people don't even know they've got it until they go for a golf lesson or try dancing or something like that. Um, so he most, almost certainly could fight and in fact probably could hide it. In fact, this is a body double. If you watch the Channel 4, the second Channel 4 documentary, um, you'll come across uh, uh, Daniel Smee, who is a, um, is this, I don't know, name escapes me, who's a virtually perfect body double for Richard III. Same height, same sort of build, slightly thin, um, which a lot of these people are, and uh, same degree of scoliosis. Uh, and they trained <laughs> the poor lad to become a soldier. He put on about a stone and a half in weight in the four or five months they filmed the documentary uh, in muscle because they, they made a suit of armour for him and when he walked in the room with a suit of armour on, I can tell you, you didn't think he's got a scoliosis. You thought, that looks like a pretty mean dude. Um, and they and taught him to ride a horse. So we can sort of learn some information uh, about uh, people and, and it makes us think um, sort of what else we've got to do. We've decided we've identified him, DNA, bones, uh, the right place, the right time, all those things, 
are all lining up and so we can be fairly confident it's him then we say how he died well to be honest again we're not going to say on ct how somebody dies and in real life we don't do that as a radiologist i do not speculate on forensic cts i stick to the facts it's like the talk we had about prediction there are, as soon as you start predicting things you get yourself wrong and in trouble a lot of the times and people love correcting you and picking you up but when we stick to the facts we're generally right so we generally stick to the facts and leave other people to predict but the easy way of saying this is that we have a strong history of what happened to him and the bones we have support that <coughs> with the halberd to the back of the head um, we also found some injuries in the pelvis which suggest that while he was lying over the horse somebody probably shoved the spear up his backside um, which obviously he would have been he wouldn't have noticed at the time do we need the 3d printing well actually 3d assessment of bones is uh, quite useful in the forensic world and when I started doing this about 15 years ago we couldn't find any none of our medical software was very good for this because it's all based around living people and putting things back together is quite tricky and uh, one thing that uh, our team uh, have started using is a program which is free called Blender. And if any of you do amateur movies or uh, things like that, it's incredibly a powerful program that you can just get free off the net to do very complex 3D uh, manipulations of data. But it works also perfectly off a DICOM set. And if you want to make, you can, this is our sort of standard 3D modeling, and this is the Blender modeling. But with the Blender modeling, you can put it all back together again. Now, why would you want to? Well, forensically, it can be useful to see if you've got all the bits. Uh, if there's a bit missing that you want to put in, is that bit belong to this skeleton? And you can insert it in as a jigsaw, and, and Blender works quite well for that. So why are we going to use CT forensically for our patients? So patients who die um, without a, either of suspicious circumstances, of traumatic circumstances, sometimes post-operatively, or without a medical cause of death, need to have a medical cause of death in an explanation. So even a natural death, unsuspicious natural death, if there is no doctor to give a medical cause of death, they will generally need an investigation, and that will generally be done by autopsy. And in England and Wales, we have one of the highest autopsy rates in the world. For a variety of reasons, some of it's cultural and has built up over many years. Some of it's been a lack of reversal of old practices because of the Shipman affair. Um, but we have an autopsy rate of, well it's dropped from about 24% to about 16% over the last eight years. So it's still nearly one in five of cases end up having an autopsy, which is a surprise to a lot of people. Um, these are just people who often drop dead at 70, 80, 90 years old end up having an autopsy to get a medical cause of death. And often it's to diagnose a natural disease process that killed them. Well, CT scanning is what we use every day to diagnose natural disease processes. So it seems a logical thing to do to either use CT instead of autopsy if you can, and if you can't, if you're going to do what is effectively major surgery on a body to try and find out what happened to it, doing a CT scan first seems quite reasonable. I'm not going to touch too much on trauma um, because uh, I think there's a better talk on trauma coming up after me. Um, in these sort of scenarios, we don't tend to use CT to replace autopsy, but it is incredibly useful for demonstrating mechanisms of injury to juries, to police. The police really like this uh, because it helps them see what's going on inside rather than turning up to the autopsy, which uh, is quite difficult for them to understand. Whereas a CT scan, you can read the autopsy report, see the CT scan. And we then can often look into scenarios, and particularly with uh, traumatic or uh, even homicides, does the damage fit the story? And if it fits, that's fine, or does it not? Um, this is just a scenario of a, a car driver with a witness collision with a lamppost, no previous health problems, no signs of life, but no obvious cause of death immediately apparent. 
And sometimes in car accidents, as you may see on uh, particularly gruesome things, but you know, ambulance people will tell you, fire people will tell you, the cause of death is often immediately apparent when you arrive at a, a car accident. But in the, this case, the CT very rapidly showed atlanto-occipital dissociation. Uh, cause of death immediately seen, so therefore you have a traumatic cause of death. She, she obviously could have died before the car accident, but the chances are she died of the car accident. Sometimes you might see a body in a car and there is no cause of death. The trauma is not bad enough to cause death. And then you might say, did they have a heart attack? And often in those situations it's obvious because the car has gone slowly into the wall. In one case in Leicester, it was because the husband had killed their partner, put them in the car, drove into a tree with his safety belt and airbag, operational, no safety belt and airbag on the other side. He didn't get away with it, it was the pesky kids. The children said, she never doesn't wear a seat belt, and they smelt a rat and they come... Uh, they put in a complaint to the police immediately and then there was a full investigation. And again, the trauma didn't fit, there wasn't enough bleeding in the sites of trauma, a full autopsy uh, discovered the truth. One reason why I would uh, encourage everyone who has the opportunity to do this type of work, particularly with trauma, is talking in the, uh, the talk earlier on today on, say, head and neck fractures and Lefort fractures and so on. These are the things we're looking for in our ED practice. We see them all the time in road traffic collision deaths. So this is occipital condyle fracture, missed all the time because they're uncommon, because they requ generally require severe injury. They're often fatal, but you don't want to miss it. Uh, and it's nice to be able to see a lot of scans with the fractures that you don't normally see. The pterygoid plate fractures, very common in road traffic collision injuries, less common now with airbags and uh, seat belts and ED. <clears throat> and some of this work is just what we do always. Um, this is a case where we didn't require autopsy, but it would have gone for investigation. Drop dead, 82 year old female, acute severe headache. In A&E, we would just do a CT head. We'd see something like that. You generally see more severe pathology in post-mortem. The scans are a bit different, but like all radiology, it's all about learning normal, this time learning normal for dead, and then when it's not normal, you can look it up. Slightly different pathology, which is again quite nice to do this. Two reasons that you see different things. One is because you get specialist, you become a GI radiologist, you become a neuroradiologist. If you become a PMCT radiologist, that's a move back to being a general radiologist again. We can't afford to have five different radiologists reporting a, a PMCT scan. So you'll see things that you don't normally see because of that, but you'll also see things that we don't see because we don't image well, we image heads all the time with Alzheimer's and so on, but we don't image choking. Uh, and this is choking. It doesn't look like much, but that's just a sign that we're starting to get used to. Used to. And then you can have a look down, and there is a, a whole load of vegetable matter and, and so on blocking the throat. This is a case that encourages us to do CT. Um, 24-year-old female Asian. These three cases uh, actually all have uh, their families all gave consent for education and research reasons, uh, which is a routine that we did in, in our research in Leicester. Um, but this 28-year-old female had a normal day at work the day before, was dropped off at home at uh, 9.30. Medical records, we get those, had some recent asthma and mild neck pain and was found dead on the floor in their living room the next day having not turned up to work and there were, you could feel lymph nodes in the neck TB was suspected the autopsy uh, showed pulmonary nodules as we can see on the CT we did this as part of a blinded trial so the autopsy did not see the uh, CT scan, but both autopsy and CT agreed that there was pulmonary TB. And in fact, the cause of death given to the coroner was pulmonary TB. 
And on the autopsy report, the pathologist said he didn't understand how pulmonary TB would cause somebody to drop dead, having been at work the day before. But TB is a funny disease. The actual cause of death was retropharyngeal vertebral abscess causing a fractured C3 vertebra, which makes a lot more sense. Probably bending over to get milk out of the fridge or something, and then something that had been growing slowly for some time, causing her mild neck pain, uh, snapped, which makes more sense. Now, why didn't the autopsy detect that? Because Nobody wants to do an autopsy in somebody with active TB, particularly cutting all the way down into their neck. And CT gives the idea quickly. So even if you're going to do an autopsy, doing a CT scan first strikes is a good thing to do. If you can avoid an autopsy for a lot of people, not everybody, some people really do not care what happens to their body after death, but a lot of people do. And actually doing it less invasively is a useful thing to do for our patients. I'm gonna quickly go through what we've done is started enhancing our scans a bit. Basically, a straightforward post-mortem CT is great for bones, but for the rest of the body, it is like your worst non-contrast enhanced CT. It's okay, but you don't like reporting the abdomen if it's a horrible non-contrast enhanced CT, particularly if there's not much fat around as well. So we wanted to contrast enhance them. We actually often ventilate the lungs, which makes them look more like what we're used to. And that's easy to do, a small uh, tracheostomy and insufflate the lungs. And yet you can super glue it back together again, you wouldn't know we've done it. People don't bruise. And we can also do angiography and it's amazing what you can achieve. I wouldn't have believed, I would have thought there'd be too much post-mortem clot, too much blood, but in fact you can do it with air or contrast. But what we tend to do Fine, it's not particularly required to be able to demonstrate an aortic aneurysm like that. It's a very expensive procedure just to uh, demonstrate that. And what we tend to do is a targeted coronary angiography approach, because that's really what we're interested in, sudden death. And we found that with a simple Foley catheter, cut down Foley catheter, we can show up the coronary arteries, if they're normal, to that level of quality. They're often abnormal, obviously, in sudden death in adults and sometimes demonstrate the ventricles. So pulling it all together, this is the sort of case now where we can avoid an autopsy that would always go to autopsy in other circumstances. Um, slightly close to my own heart, but um, a male of a certain age uh, deciding he's gonna take up cycling to get fit and was found dead next to his bicycle next to the road. No witnesses, an investigation will obviously happen at that point. And of course, CT is great for excluding trauma. The neck is absolutely fine. There is no neck fracture, there's no skull fracture. Um, obviously, external examination will tell you a lot of this. No evidence of traumatic death, coronary angiography, and he's got a soft plaque in his proximal left anterior descending artery. This is a normal, with normal myocardial enhancement. We still get that, even enhancement deficit in the left ventricle. It's not always as perfect as that. You can see it in a straight CPR there. And we can confidently say he has had a myocardial event. I can't say he's had a myocardial infarction. I suspect in this case it was a myocardial infarction. But he has certainly had an ischemic myocardial event. That is why he's died. What we do depends hugely on context. And the value, the, the validity of our result depends on context context but that's the same as our routine practice in some cases with the right history and the right scan we can be a hundred percent confident sometimes we can only be 50 percent confident and what we've got to decide is is this good enough for the investigation we're doing if the investigation requires beyond all doubt then perhaps we need more tests if it's on the balance of probabilities for the coroner then we can often make a decision about what's required So I encourage you, where you can, in what hospitals you are, try and get involved with what's going on. We do do training in Leicester. We have an MSC, PG Cert, PG Dip, MSC course, distance learning, 
um, which you, if you just search Leicester PMCT MSC or something like that, you'll find it quick enough. And we're also running courses for radiologists, more ad hoc, but we're advertising them now through the Royal College site. We do a three-day course. It's focused on consultants at the moment, but registrars will be welcome uh, as a course. And what we do there is specifically for radiologists, three days to get the dark arts. What's different between general CT reporting and PMCT? Thank you.